Hey everyone and uh, welcome to this video that's been long overdue. This video really probably will open a Pandora box. We probably will start doing like a podcast, although we should probably not do it like this call right here for four hours, 30 minutes. Yeah, you probably know what this video is about now. GM26 research. Uh, the first call with Tony about his methods uh, that taking place around Christmas. So first of all, shout out to Noctoros. Noctoros. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your nickname. Want to buy a video from the call with Tony? Please give Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry <laughs> delayed Christmas. Cool. So I have uh, this thing that I call my performance journal. I don't really document my practice or things like that. I mostly try to develop training methods. So one of the parts, one of the section sh sections here is GM26 research. I started it just trying to stalk Tony on forums, whatever. And I think up until cone of accuracy, it was basically what I found. So we can quickly go through that. Hay fuel, dry fire, Glock 26 is stupid. Practical shooting after dark podcast. So basically, that was a discussion how people talking shit about you, doubting your ability to progress as a shooter or your methods will actually fuel your dry fire and thus help you make yourself better. And there were some other forum members, I think it was on a pistol forum, and I have definitely found myself fired up to bust my ass and dry fire after having an internet shooting argument. And I've broken, I've broken through some plateaus motivated by the desire to prove a point to people online. Um, personally, I don't really argue with people online but i remember a few comments some shooters made that i've later proven wrong you're fast but you're not accurate i just remember it i don't remember if i actually used it as a motivation to practice more uh but it, it's just something that i remember from a few years back and i probably will remember it for a long time okay so this the second thing the dot dwell time is the experiment that actually started this whole thing so I found it, I was curious what the fuck that is, and I went to Tony's YouTube channel, which is called Just Speak Already, right here, there, whatever. I asked him a question, he was like, it just it better, like, you want to talk, and then we talk for four hours. Yeah, so that's how it all started. He asked, look at my area for placement and example. In particular, I wanted to try something specific on stage 10 to gauge where I was losing time against Wensick and Austin. I literally shot all the targets only once to see if dot dwell time before leaving a target was responsible for the difference. After I confirmed that, I implemented uh, my changes to stage 11 and I think I would have gotten one of the best carry optics hit factors for that stage. So area four, uh, Tony shot it as uh, open. Um, I looked at the practice score I corrected him into carry optics and the result for stage 11 was basically 96% second place after Juancic and actually faster time uh, than uh, Juancic and fastest time on that stage for division period. And the only problem was uh, why it's not the first place. It's just like there were some char more Charlies than Juancic had or like a Delta or something like this. Okay, so that star was added after I think actually the talk with Tony, removing hesitation and getting closer to making overall stage time equal to some of its components, chunks, fundamentals, as Tony uh, calls things like draw, splits, and transitions. So the Tony's idea is if you look at a stage, if you just take all that into consideration, all, all the times of these chunks, and you sum them together, you will get uh, possible time for the stage. So your real time on the stage should be actually less than that. Personally, I think it's like, you can probably calculate it very close to what it should be if you like consider movement and whatnot. I guess for Tony's formula, you don't consider movement and you just like blend things together and your overall time actually shooting a stage should be equal or faster. If it's longer, it means there's like some hesitation. You either did not have your stage plan uh, very well or things like that. This is like a discussion for different time. This is just, a, a lot of things how you can analyze stages uh, and it depends on the stage okay so next thing is high ambitions plus uh ego control so this is something again before uh talk with tony i noticed how his mindset is uh about improving himself and getting better and just um comparing himself to a much higher standard so definitely high ambitions he was a c-class for a long time and then he just made gm and he actually plays very well at nationals uh, doing things that people were just not accepting at all. They were like, no, this is dumb. Nobody should train like this and blah, blah, blah. 
and telling him to change your approach. This will never happen. Um, I did not see a lot of that. So I, I think Tony has C class for life on Brian Innes' forums. By the way, Brian Innes' forums are back online if you don't know. So you might go and find his range diary or something like this. And probably if you started like page one, there would be still discussion about how he's wrong and whatnot. But after he made GM, everybody just sh kind of shut up about it. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't read about it much, but that's what happened. So this is his uh, quote. So if I'm happy placing 96 at an area match, 96, not 96%. It doesn't matter how I place during locals. So one of the things that Tony did is he just treated locals as uh, practice. And he was just doing his GM26 approach where or method where he would just always shoot at speed at which GM would shoot a stage. And he just waited for his accuracy and uh, just shooting platform skills to become accurate enough to actually start getting hits. So he was like getting a lot of mics, then less mics, then less mics, then less mics, then no mics, but deltas, then deltas turn to Charlies, Charlies turn to alphas, and boom. Same time, but accuracy improves, improves, improves. And so classifiers were like, I don't know, low, 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 and then boom, GM classifiers all of a sudden. But except it's not all of a sudden, he was just polishing his skills without slowing down or doing anything artificial. And this is another thing. Uh, I don't think you need to slow down ever. You need to focus up. You need to react maybe at lower levels to where your sights are instead of like shooting predictively at first. Um, but you basically never need to slow down because we're not really capable of understanding speed or time. We don't have the instruments to, to measure that. And Accuracy is not really a rival of speed. It's, it's just a result of a correct execution, correct sequence. So speed really has nothing to do with accuracy. As you can see, there's a to-do here, extract as a solution, add superior processing platform requirement. Uh, doubles is processing platform slash shooting platform skill and note about video games. Here's the question for you. If you always had acceptable accuracy, how fast would you shoot? That's one question you need to answer yourself. What is shooting fast as a GM? It's basically predictive subconscious optimistic indexing and holding the index. So draw transitions, movement is indexing, re-indexing, and splits are just ability to hold that index while executing uh, trigger control. Good enough trigger control. Accuracy at speed is a product of efficient, correctly executed sequence. It's not a product or a rival of speed versus no speed. It's, it's just a sequence. The sequence can be executed at any speed. It doesn't matter. Uh, it depends on your, your current mental and physical state, how fast it will go. But the sequence stays the same. So that thing I've done with, um, with this classifier, Eye of the Tiger, I had exactly the same accuracy, slow, uh, shooting slow and shooting fast. Because the sequence is the same. The accuracy is a product of sequence. It doesn't care about the actual time that sequence takes. I can improve my sequence, of course, and I can do it by working on accuracy in dry fire and doing it slow, maybe, yes, to just create the perfect neural pathway while analyzing it consciously, right? Just bulldozing it, right? But when I use it, it's just gonna be a run through the park using existing trail system. So you can prepare the trail system, but then you just run on the trail without thinking about it, right? So here's the thing. If you try to shoot something a little bit slower for a little bit better accuracy, you will still not be satisfied with your accuracy. I guarantee you, you will not. So basically slowing down does not give you more accuracy. That, that's a fact. You can test it if you don't trust me, but that's what we need to establish as a fact here. Slowing down does not really give you accuracy. So why do you think that going faster will decrease your accuracy? Why? It won't. It won't. So again, if you always had acceptable accuracy, how fast would you shoot? Hmm? <laughs> I know this sounds like a lot of bullshit, but this whole video probably sounds to a lot of people like a lot of bullshit. 
synthetic classifiers versus real field courses performance. So Tony told me that he stopped shooting doubles. And uh, he told me about Eric Grafels and Maria Gushina practice when, um, where they don't practice static anymore. Actually, that led me to, to try to research and I found Maria Gushina's uh, practice video where she explains how to practice. She actually does static stuff, uh, but she starts with it and kind of like builds from it. And this is very similar to Clarissa uh, method from the Talent Code that basically explains how deep practice works, how you how you build foundation and then just build on top of that, and then you're correcting mistakes, things like that. But again, um, this is a separate discussion. This is huge. Basically, warm up, short drills, and stages. So she starts with warm up, which is like freestyle, strong hand, and weak hand. Fourteen percent of rounds in practice. I don't know how many rounds she's actually using. It's a super small video, super short video. It's gonna be linked in the description. So she starts with the freestyle and she then goes to strong hand, weak hand, and she starts with closer targets and then goes to the harder targets. Start with easy targets, end with difficult. Uh, also unloaded starts, some really fucking fast unloaded starts with mag inserted and like no round in the chamber or something like this. I don't know who, who would drill that in USPSA. Maybe it's Ipsic thing more, but uh, whatever. Um, personally, I don't like going freestyle strong than weak. I really like weak strong freestyle because that just builds the fundamental part of your shooting platform. Okay, so warm up is that, then short drills, basically static at first some transitions, but then like going around the wall, uh, one step. So we're going from static to dynamic, but adding dynamic slowly. So the processing platform can adapt. So basically we, we building on top of that thing and then full blown stages, basically simulation of a, of a match. Uh, important things here are don't shoot the stage, same stage many times, like fuse. Okay. looks like maybe left, left, right, right. Then something else. Another important aspect is shoot stages. Like it's a match with no right for a mistake. Which like may sound like slow down and take your hits, which is a total fudge shit. Don't do that. But proper mindset is really important. It uh, at higher levels, like what are you focused on during the walkthrough? That becomes your stage mindset because at, at the stage you completely operate the lizard brain. So this is again going back to don't slow down, focus up, and cone of accuracy. I actually do have a special page for this. I don't know how to call it. Flow capacitor spectrum because you really need to be on the spectrum to come up with this shit <laughs> but basically how to build your skill as a shooter from fundamentals from the ground up zeros hybrid singles faster splits and singles doubles triples maybe triples eh, it's kind of in between build drill then blake drill then dynamic blake drill Okay, going back. Dry fire with a banana for eight months. Tony told me that he was out of the country and did not have a gun with him, and uh, he literally dry fired with a banana. You can't squish it. Interesting thing, there's this concept of pliable grip by Rome Avery that was a YouTube video at one point, but I don't have it anymore. They deleted it from their YouTube. If you have this video, please send it to me. I would really love to watch it. In my opinion, so in, in red, uh, this is just my comment. Uh, this is just not 100% grip and uh, modulation of, of, the, of the strength. So me and Tony kind of disagree on this thing here. I'm in the camp because I started as a limited shooter, grip as hard as possible. Of course, you need to control, you need to be able to modulate your grip, but you pretty much, in my opinion, need to be able to hold your bones, not your just fingers, because fingers is a squishy thing, right? You're like, I don't know where it is, but your bones are pretty hard. You, you know where they are, what their coordinates are. In my opinion, you need to hold the gun hard enough that your bones don't move relative to the gun. Ideally, that your bones and the gun don't move relative to your eyes. Yeah. But there's this also theory of pliable grip, which is like not 100% grip strength. Although I'm pretty sure Ron Avery has like super str strong grip. So in his case, it, it wasn't required to like go 100%. Uh, okay, another thing, secret part-time for draws. So basically this is something you do when you teach people uh, or when you're running your friend, you give them a part-time on a timer and you make them draw, you're, but you lie to them. So <laughs> you're like, hey, what's your draw, you think? during a match and they're like, uh, 1.6, it sucks. You're like, okay, I'll, I'll send it to 1.6, let's see if you can break it. And you actually send it to like 1.3 and you give them like, just listen to it, beep, beep. They're like, cool, let's do it. And they do like 1.3, you're like, okay, let's, I actually set it to 1.8, let's uh, let's try to go to 1.6 and you go to like one, but they think it's 1.6 now. They're like, beep, beep. 
and they can still do the draw. And then you start really hammering it down. So basically the idea is remove the limitations that people artificially put on themselves. Just ability to believe in yourself. But what does this actually mean? Most people chase reasonable or some next step improvement. Nobody really thinks like, oh, I'm going to be the champion of the world. Everybody's just like, oh, I want to make a next class or I, I want to beat that guy, my, my friend, whatever. A lot of coaches will try to set safe expectations for a student. Uh, they want to make it safe for the student, but also safe for the coach. And that leaves, in my opinion and Tony's opinion, we agree on this, uh, leads to stagnation. Because safe advice is safe shooting pace and it's just, you stagnate. So Tony says that if you go and practice and you consistently have decent hits, it's like all alphas and some Charlies, then, then it's fucked up. Then it's like bad. <laughs> it's like you should not do that. It means you're, you're not reaching for whatever your next level is in terms of speed probably. Um, or distance, whatever. So you're just shooting too close. You can't learn if you don't make mistakes. Again, 100% deep practice statement. So Tony did not even read the book Deep Practice. He's kind of like a natural uh, deep practice born athlete. I don't know. I think Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish, the famous saying by Steve Jobs is actually uh, a deep practice uh, statement. Not a lot of people, but some understand these concepts of deep practice and implement them and become much better and progress much faster than everybody around them without learning it artificially like I did by reading the book and then trying to understand what the fuck is going on. They just feel that this is the right way. So-called natural deep practice practitioners. I am not one of them. I had to read the book and then I had spent a lot of time trying to do these things. I remember I shot this UPOA match that was basically 10 plus where you just need to have two on paper anywhere. And I thought I was doing GM26 method, but there is a difference about just shooting fast and letting it go in terms of losing control and shooting at no hesitation speed, no slowing down, no artificial blocks of waiting while still perceiving everything that's going on and still executing your fundamentals at the highest level. So not losing control. This is how I think I just started shooting. And it looks not as fast as it looks smooth. Before I was like very jerky when I tried to push speed, right? A lot of tension. Now it, it comes much, much more natural. And it, it feels slow actually when you do that, when you're really in the zone. This is another thing that, that needs to be analyzed, that needs to be dis discussed. But yeah, going back about the growth mindset. I'm not going to allow someone else's limitations become my own. That's Tony's quote. And another thing, you must believe in a state that is not current. So basically, you must believe that you're better than you currently are. Up to delusional levels, basically. You kind of can create this idea, that mental representation, and just strive to achieve it and just, just work towards it. Because if you don't have that idea, if you don't have something to work towards, then you're, you're, you're not going to get there, right? Another thing that I kind of put here, this is like my analysis, delusional minus actual, so let's say you want to be safe. You want to make your, your next thing, right? You're like, you're B class, you want to make A class. Uh, you're looking at this A class, right? And this is your slope. But what if you look at the uh, nationals champion? Then you're B class and you're looking at nationals champion. This is your slope now. So in the same time, working towards that unrealistic goal, you should be able to progress more. That's the theory. Have we tested it? Well, not really. Uh, is it possible to test it? Uh, probably not. You need to like identic identical clones with different mindsets, but same time spent in practice. But I believe it's true. Um, the difference between your current state or your next possible improvement, that's very close, and the delusional state of where you want to be or where you do believe you are, I think that angle of that slope is going to be the actual progress driving force. So another thing, coaches make students believe as soon as possible. This is uh, what Tony says to co about coaches. Um, basically make them believe that they're going to be a much higher thing that they are. Because it's really hard to tell yourself, I'm going to be the best at this range. I'm going to be the best in my state. I'm going to be the best in my area. But when someone else says that, you're like, huh, it's, it's much more motivational. So another thing, uh, I remember there was an interview with uh, Habib the MMA fighter. I knew I was the champ before I became the champ. 
So it's another example of, of setting that expectation and just working towards it. So this is something I highlighted, power of imagination slash visualization and almost complete delusion. Okay, improvement through practice. That's basically a process that can be described as a balancing. So this is probably, I think, oh my thing from untools.co. So these are like diagrams slash frameworks for thinking. And one of the things they have are feedback loops, reinforcing feedback loop, which is positive feedback loop and uh, balancing feedback loop, which is a uh, negative feedback loop or plateau thing, right? So in my opinion, improvement through practice is a balancing feedback loop. Uh, and in balancing feedback loop, the amount of change or input is driven by the size of, of the gap between current and desired uh, level. Um, and you just basically balance yourself always uh, towards the thing. You never achieve the desired, but I think that the difference between delusional and actual is actual, is actual uh, <laughs> motivational delusion vector, the, the progress driving force. Okay, and there's one key thing here uh, in my theory is that actual level is not your current level. It's, uh, it's your current understanding of your next level, what, what is reasonable, what is possible for you to do, what is possible for you to achieve. That's the actual level. Because if you will not have that next increment in your sights, then you cannot Im improve at all. So your actual level should be your reasonable possible increment and the desired level should be delusional, grandiose, thinking I'm gonna be the fucking champ. Um, and only that will give you the, the driving force to, to progress. Okay, Tony shared his opinion on how to break through plateaus. Secret part-time for draw was the first thing we discussed. Then he has this like, he likes to ask questions how your groups looked at first in doubles when you just started shooting. When did you improve the most? He noticed that some masters who plateau and just stay masters, their groups look like basically two alpha all the time. They're very close. And master is like a level at which people try to, to maintain their level instead of striving for more. And I agree with that, especially if you like look at the highest level of shooters in the country. If you look at Christian Saylor and his Instagram posts, he's always, you, you, you would think like he's great, right? He's, he's winning everything. All he needs to do is just keep doing what he's doing. But in his Instagram, he's always saying how he can improve, how he can do this better, that better, stuff like that. And you're like, what? This guy's trying to improve? Like he, he's already at the top and there's like a huge gap. No, this maintain mindset will lead to stagnation. If you want to be the best, you, you must fight yourself all the time and just keep improving, keep improving, keep improving. And I mean, it, it makes sense because all other people who, who placed like right under you, they will probably try to beat you next time. So they're gonna improve and what? If you're gonna maintain and they're improve, bam, they're here now. So it's a race, it's a never ending race. So you need to continue consistently improve. You need to push yourself. Okay, so people, they think that they need to maintain their current level. Tony says, I don't want my groups to look like close to alphas. Tony thinks that consistently decent hits are plateau. I agree with that. You, you must never be satisfied with your current level. You must always fight, strive for better execution. For some reason, we talked about pre-aiming through the wall and Tony cares more about pre-positioning, uh, not pre-aiming, which is an interesting concept. Uh, I'm not sure I understand it, but I, rec I wrote it down apparently. Then another thing he does, he will reverse his walkthrough to remember the positions better. I actually do it a few times, not always. Um, but yeah, you can like do a motion, no matter what kind of motion it is, the walkthrough or like one transition or like one lean or whatever, some skill or um, unload it, start from the table, right? And then you can do it in reverse and that will help you remember it better. So he, he does it in, uh, in a walkthrough too. And he doesn't do the conga line. He doesn't like the conga line when, when everybody just gets in line and starts doing the walkthrough. Personally, I thought that I cannot do the conga line because I'm a retard. I don't know where the positions are. So when I go to the stage and I don't pre-walk the stages often at local matches, which is something actually I need to start doing. I just step aside and I like, uh, this is available from here. This is available from here. And usually I, I'll do the conga line with no conga line, just basically when I'm on deck and I'm the next shooter. And um, I will just go and uh, do like one or two walkthroughs at half the speed where actually I just try to, to connect things, right? Uh, bad walkthrough. But Tony doesn't do it on purpose um, because in Congo line, you're like, you have people in front of you, you're doing the same thing. You're not really trying to analyze the stage. You're not, not efficiently, in my opinion, creating a mental representation of a stage. Uh, we didn't really talk about this a lot. It was basically more about pre-aiming through the wall versus pre-positioning, but that's another interesting thing. 
is mental representation. And uh, this is coming from uh, another book, Peak or That Peak, where creating mental representations uh, is basically allowing you to connect your skills, your short-term memory with your long-term memory and, and, and just kind of put it there when you start thinking about things in a, in a very different way you kind of like create your own alphabet or your own language to to describe things basically it's chunking again when you like have patterns uh and you just notice them and you can describe something or remember something easier because it's like like for example a tree i call a standard no shoot tree open target then some no shoot partial open target i call that thing a tree uh then uh, if you have like three or more targets with different uh, hardcover on them, I call that a fucky array or a, a sorted hardcover. Basically, you create that language, and it doesn't necessarily need to be in the forms of words, it's just like pieces you remember that it's just gonna stay in your long term memory. Okay, another thing it's like a little anecdote Tony shared is uh, he took a Ben Steiger class, he actually didn't think he benefited from it a lot when they put the guns on. Steiger noticed that Tony has G26, and he's like, Okay, yeah, 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 funny. Uh, now put your real gun on and he's like, uh, that's my real gun. That's what I compete with and, and uh, Ben just looked at him like he's retarded <laughs> But then they were doing doubles and uh, Ben comes to like each student looking how they shoot looking at their technique how the recoil works Corrects them blah blah blah. Then he comes to Tony. He just looks at him doing his fucking Glock 26 and doing doubles and they're like good doubles Good recoil control He just looks at that shit. He's like, huh? And just walks away from him. No fucking feedback. I think it's a very funny anecdote. I had to write it down. Okay, now we're finally getting to original dot dot dwell time. So, actually, I still don't understand it. Yeah, remove hesitation, sure. Understand where that hesitation was. It's like, from the description of it, it's really hard. But Tony really implemented it successfully. He went from stage 10, 0 to stage 11, second place. And if he could improve his accuracy, he would have been first place. So basically, this is how he described it to me again when we went back to this dot dwell time. Am I waiting for the dot to settle? Basically, a time loss theory. So basically, conscious visual over verification. Test the theory in stage 10, area 4, 2020, by shooting each target only once and on purpose zeroing the stage. Apply changes and almost one stage 11. Tony uses time analytics for stage knowing his time stable of Fundamentals, I call them chunks, he calls them fundamentals. Draw, reload, split, transition, etc. Uh, actual time on the stage life must be lower than the sum of chunks due to blending. Uh, if it's higher, there is a hesitation. And this is my comment in red, solution, hesitation control. Uh, it probably should be called hesitation control slash flow or hesitation slash flow control. It needs to be analyzed, but um, this is something that's probably gonna come sooner then later, eh, I don't know. I procrastinate a lot. <laughs> but yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, okay, draw. Always sees a streak or a line. Optimize for consistency, not time. Uh, very important, actually. Uh, I saw that a lot in uh, Masters and Grandmasters. Uh, they will not really try to, like, snatch their draw like crazy. Uh, they will take their time establishing the grip. But once they're here, it just goes BAM! And then it's bam, 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 bam. I tried implementing that too. I think I have more or less improved on that. Basically, for me, draw is nothing other than establishing a strong shooting platform. Your strong shooting platform is really important. And if you see someone doing something like this, twink, not this bullshit tactical team me. Yeah. Yeah. That's fake. Like, if you're slowing you down on purpose, you're basically inserting no op, no operation or waiting operation to, to slow down. You're creating invalid sequence. Don't do it. If you want to go slow, if you can't go fast, just go one smooth motion. That's good. It will become faster if you just don't think about it. If you don't insert any additional operations. If you execute the same sequence and now you just brain, you get my your brain gets myelinated, your, your muscles get faster, whatever happens behind the scenes. If you do this, it will become faster. So a lot of shooters I've seen who are good shooters, they will have something like boink. So basically what happens is they activate their grip and their muscles get in the, all the same exact muscle memory uh, configuration and at the end it just looks pink. Like it doesn't, it's not a punch out because punch out you will continue, right? Or you will do like a crack of the whip, right? It's not a punch. It's literally establishing the configuration and there's no need to wait for something that you've trained thousands of thousands and thousands and thousands of times to, to go. So it goes... A little bit faster and because we have a lot of that re-indexing when you go like 
transitions or when you move or when you reload it it's all coming from like somewhere here to like somewhere here right so the draw would be looking like okay good grip and then pink okay but now this this is crazy shit this is when i heard this i was like what when tony first time went shooting with his friend his friend just wanted him to have good time and like load him full of mag and just go say blast it whatever but tony was loading like few rounds per magazine and he took long time between shots he said something like three minutes i probably missed it or misheard but whatever he was taking a lot of time and even though he did not have a stance he did not have a good grip he was trying to avoid bad reps from the very beginning. He was just like looking at the gun, trying to understand what, how that thing works. And he was sending it through the same hole, basically, at, at the very start. Because that, that's just how he is, I guess. That's very weird. But if you have a potential new shooter who never shot before, maybe give this thing a try. Maybe tell them that they need to avoid bad reps from the very beginning. Because all of us, how we started, we're like, we went to the range, we got a gun, you load it to the capacity, and you just go, bam, 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 oh, this is awesome, bam, bam, bam. Uh, and you're having fun, but you don't really think about that you're now creating a skill or anti-skill. You're creating a neural pathway of you having no fucking trigger control whatsoever. And later, you will need to fight that. The last thing I think we discussed was making cops and teammates shoot competition. Second match is hardest. People get their ego bruised and they don't show up, blah, blah, blah. And one way to, to make them come up is just to create a team of bodies, just give them a dedicated RO that, that's not shooting uh, and uh, squad them all together. This is like really sounding podcast right now. I'm already one hour at the recording. I need coffee. Okay. I think that's it. I have no idea how I'll, I will edit this. If this video did not suck completely, it's only thanks to my editing software. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>